In 2010, this painting by Roy Lichtenstein, called Oh All Right, sold at auction for $42 million. Mark your winner at $42 million. An original Lichtenstein is a little out of my budget, but I think I can build a painting robot that can make a convincing copy. Roy's artwork featured bold lines plus thousands of little dots called Bende Dots. His art sort of looks like what Ant-Man would see if he shrunk down and looked at a comic book. Oh wow, look at that. A while back I attempted one of his paintings, but I had trouble keeping the dots aligned. But a robot should be able to place the dots perfectly. So I'm going to have it paint this huge canvas and see if my robot can replicate one of these million dollar paintings. This was a massive project that included design, 3D printing, custom hardware, custom software, artistry both digital and physical, and it had many challenges and issues to overcome. What, uh, what is it doing? I considered different designs, but what I settled on was doing a giant XY plotter. For the frame, I used C-beam V-slot aluminum rails. Maker Store sells these gantry plates and wheel kits that can glide along the track. It's a huge structure at 13 feet wide and 9 feet tall. The wall in my studio is the perfect place to build the robot, test it, and to paint the canvas. While stepper motors are normally used in plotters, laser engravers, and 3D printers, a lot of modern robots like the Boston Dynamics Robot Dog use pancake actuators. I want to get better at building robots and controlling motors with code, so I wanted to use them for this project. I reached out to my actuator and they sent me a little something. Check out this motor. Wow. These smart motors are much more capable than a stepper motor. For one, I can just tell it to go to a specific position and it'll go there. But also, with the motor's planetary gears, you get good torque and a crazy amount of precision in a compact package. Where a stepper motor might have 200 steps per rotation, this motor has 324,000 steps in each rotation. This means that each step only moves my print head 0.18 microns, which is about 400 times smaller than a human hair. And at the same time, the motor can move to any of over 4 billion steps, which means that theoretically my robot could be half a mile wide. In reality, the precision is much more limited than that. I went with a belt-driven system, and it's difficult to keep perfect tension on a belt this long. And that does introduce some extra play. I do have an idea of how to improve this for a later version, but it's okay for now. This is an art project. I'm not making a brain surgery robot. Yet. The rails and plates were purchased, but I made several custom parts. I designed an adapter plate so the motor could be mounted to the gantry plate. The rest of the parts were designed in Fusion 360 and 3D printed. I printed an adapter to attach the gear pulley to the motor and the entire print head mechanism. Somehow the robot needs to be able to put paint on canvas. First, it's important to mention that I'm not doing CMYK, which is also known as four color process. That's how an inkjet printer works. Roy Lichtenstein's paintings weren't made that way. They had a limited color palette and each color was applied individually. I'm also not making a large printer. I won't be able to feed this a photo and have it replicated. This is a painting robot. When I tried to paint it, I used a dauber to paint the dots. Push in and out and you have a dot. But with that method, there's a weird pattern to the paint inside the dot. So drawing the dot with some sort of paint pen seems to be the best idea. The pens I'm using are acrylic paint pens from T5 and they work really well on canvas. You can find them on Amazon and the link is in the description. Using them will be a lot less complex than trying to make my own paint delivery device. And honestly, it's not that big of a deal to swap out pins periodically. I'll just need a lot of pins. The print head has an over-engineered mechanism that holds the pin and can push it into the canvas, but also has rubber bands that act like a shock absorber to cushion the pin against the surface. This should provide fairly even pin pressure. The print head and gantry plates also have a safety mechanism. These motors are no joke. When you tell it to move, it's going to move no matter what is in the way. In testing, there were a few times when I had given the motor a move command but failed to get it the stop command. So it will just keep going and going. The thought of that is pretty terrifying. What would happen if it crashed into the side of the frame? That would not be good. To prevent that, power to the motor is wired through these limit switches on both sides of the gantry plate. If the plate hits the side, it flips the limit switch and cuts the power, preventing the robot from destroying itself. And let me tell you, a couple of times these limit switches prevented a catastrophe. Hey, every robot needs a name. I asked GPT what to call it, and it had a few suggestions, but I didn't like any of those. So I finally came up with Roybot. ChatGPT approved. <laughs> I told one of my friends this, and he said, that's better than Lickbot. But what do you think? Let me know in a comment below. 
Okay, I have the robot built, but for it to paint like Liechtenstein, I'm gonna need some software that can put down precision paint strokes. And to do that, I gotta get these motors to move. One way is that you tell the motor where to go and how fast to get there, and the motor does the rest. It'll move to that position and stop. But the move might not be linear. It could speed up on the way there. It could even overshoot the point and then come back to it. And that means this mode isn't the best for painting. Because when painting a diagonal line, two motors work together in unison, one controlling the x-axis and one controlling the y. If each motor is only concerned with getting to its destination, the result will be a wavy line, which we don't want. But this method is extremely useful for getting the paint head to an exact repeatable reference point, which is critical since I'm doing multiple passes over multiple days to paint multiple colors, and they all need to be kept in perfect alignment with each other. The other way to move the motor is to just tell it to go a certain speed. And when you do that, it will keep going at that speed until you tell it to stop or tell it to now go a different speed. You might remember that speed is distance over time. For example, if you're traveling 60 miles per hour, in one hour you will travel 60 miles. When painting a line, we know the distance between the two points. And if it moves at an exact speed, we can know the exact time it will complete the line. So based on that simple math, we can tell the two motors what speed each should go, and then at the exact right time, tell them both to stop, and they should have painted a straight line. Lines are a good start, but it also has to be able to paint thousands of those bend day dots. So I need to make sure that it can paint really good circles and really small circles. And that's harder than it sounds. So for circles or any other shape, we can calculate all the points along the path of the shape. But if we move the motors from position one to position two and then three, the motors will have to stop at each position and this jerks the motor around. It's not pretty. So for smooth motion, we constantly calculate the speed and duration that the motor needs to go to get to the next point. And then right at the exact moment it gets there, we change the motor speed so it'll start moving to the next position. As long as our timing is perfect, we should be able to move the paint head with enough accuracy to draw any shape. Why is it... Uh, what in the... Okay, these circles just suck. There's something weird going on. It has this weird bend in here. The start of every line has a little jog in it. And then the end of the circle doesn't line up with the start. All right, I figured it out. Watch in slow motion as the pin is pushed in. It jogs to the right a little. And here, as the Sharpie is pushed in, it leans. And when the pin starts to go down, the back of the pin slides down. The pin is completely loose in there. And that is causing the circle to be deformed. This isn't gonna work. Both of these issues are because of the pin mechanism. It's just not holding the pin tight enough, so unfortunately, this entire print head needs to be redesigned. And here's the new design. This one should fix the problem. The pin holder is made to hold the pin tighter. The pin is now much easier to access. And this little thumb screw makes it really easy to swap out the pins, which I'll be doing a lot. So this is a vast improvement. But there is still one issue that needs to be fixed, and it has to do with that long belt and something called backlash. When the head moves to the left to get to a specific position, it gets to here. But if it moves to the right to get to that same position, it only gets to here. In both cases, the motor is going to the correct location, but the gap is from backlash. And that kind of makes it difficult to draw accurate shapes. I have two ideas to solve this. The first is that if the pin is moving to the right, to simply add a correction amount to the destination to close the gap. That sounds like it would just work, but it gets complicated really fast when drawing real world shapes. For example, when drawing circles, there's a point at which the motor switches from moving to the left to moving to the right. And if you suddenly add the correction all at once, it can make it look even worse. So the correction has to be added and removed gradually. The other place it can get ugly is at the start of drawing a shape. Just trust me. So the very simple strategy to prevent that is to move the pin to handle the backlash weirdness before the pin is pushed in. You'll see when it draws circles, it always goes over and back. Doing this on each draw takes extra time, but it produces a much better result. Okay, finally, we can have the robot start painting our forgery, but I need to pick a painting. The Lichtenstein that Roybot is going to paint is called Not Over the Phone. Roy Lichtenstein challenged the concepts of art, originality, and plagiarism. One of his most famous works, Wham!, was inspired by a comic book panel from the DC comic All American Men of War from 1962. He didn't copy it exactly, but he definitely took the essence of it. And many of his paintings were taken from, <clears throat> I mean inspired by, comic book panels. Okay, before I go any further, I need to confess something. This isn't actually a Liechtenstein painting. I'd rather not tempt the copyright gods to go after me with some legal action, 
so I'm not going to copy one of his actual paintings. Instead, I'm making a lost Liechtenstein, a painting he could have made but didn't. This artwork, which was created by me, has all the same elements as O.L. Wright, the $42 million painting. It has the Binday dots, some solid color areas, black outlines and details, and some text in a bubble. So this should be a good test of whether or not we can replicate one of his paintings. So I can't just pick an image and click go. The next step is that the artwork has to be converted into individual paint strokes. And that's a job I do manually and it takes days and days to complete. The paint strokes are split into about 30 batches. The first batches are yellow. So let's get it painting. Okay, I'm already having a problem. The pen keeps drying out and then it just fades out. We're not getting even coverage at all and it's causing a lot of streaking. The problem is the tip has to be pushed in to make paint flow and I can't push the pin into the canvas hard enough without damaging it. After a lot of experimentation and failed attempts, I found a method to fix it. There's a valve in here that lets paint flow when it's pushed in. I need it to allow paint to flow all the time, but not so much that it drips. The fix is like a game of operation, but with a drill. I take out the nib and this little sponge, then drill three holes to puncture the membrane, and then carefully put it all back together. With this modification, I have consistent paint flow. Okay, on with painting the solid colors. I could do a paint by numbers thing where the robot draws the outlines of each of the big shapes and then I paint in all the solid areas with a brush. That would be quicker, but I think that's cheating. For this project, I really want the robot to paint it all. So my rule is that Roybot has to apply 99.9% .9 of all the paint. I'll only do minor touch-ups if needed. Okay, the solid colors are done and it's time to start the Bende dots. You might have noticed earlier in the paint file that the dots were just empty circles. The software I wrote can adjust the size of the dots and fill them in by drawing consecutively smaller circles. The dots can be a little challenging because they all need to be the same size, but the thickness of the pin increases as it wears down. I can adjust this pin thickness value up a little as it goes, and it'll make the circles a tiny bit smaller to compensate. I'm doing two passes on most of the dots, and if they look too small, I can make them bigger on the second pass. I'd say the dot sizes look pretty even. Without any black lines, I think she looks angry. The farther this goes along, the more nervous I am that something will mess it up. I just noticed these black flakes down here by the rail. I guess these are little pieces of rubber that are coming off the belt. The belt looks okay, but if it were to break while drawing, it would ruin the painting. Hopefully it'll hold up until the painting is finished. Okay, we're almost done, but now I'm seeing this white gap. According to the artwork, that should have an overlap of about three millimeters. There's also a gap down here. And if you look up at the top edge of the painting, you can see that the colors line up, but the black is down a little bit. I really thought that the 3D printed parts would be fine, but the pin mechanism is warping under the weight. Over time, it's sagging more and more, enough now that the registration is off by at least two millimeters. After this painting is done, I'll have to redesign the printhead one more time to use metal parts. But I'm not going to try to fix it now because the painting is too close to being done. I just made a paint file to fill in these two gaps. And we can finish up the black. All that's left now is the text inside the bubble. It's done. Believe it or not, it took six weeks of painting to complete. So can my robot forge a Liechtenstein? What do you think? I have to say that there's nothing like seeing it in person. In my opinion, it's quite spectacular. Something about this being painted with real paints and on a huge museum canvas makes it feel like an expensive painting. 
I think if it was hanging in a museum, nobody would doubt that it was a real Liechtenstein. But you tell me, do you think Roybot and I pulled it off? Leave a comment below and let me know. Now, here's some irony. This is an original painting and is one of a kind, and I will never have Roybot paint another copy of it. However, I will be producing some numbered prints, and each one would actually be signed by Roybot. There'll be a limited number of these available, so if you're interested, email this address to get on the waitlist. Check the description for information about that and other merch. Also, I want to thank my actuator for supplying the motors. They were very patient with me as I worked on this project for, well, for over a year. Also, thanks to T5 for supplying a ton of paint pens. Roybot isn't retiring after this. I have plans to do a couple of upgrades and create some more paintings and other artworks. And I'm already working on the idea for my next robot. So that you don't miss whatever's next, please consider subscribing. Thanks for watching. I don't know when it's going to stop.